students, how you doing tonight? Come on, let's all stand up. And if you guys want to come on down here, if you feel comfortable, come on down. Come on down to the front. We're so glad to see you this evening. We're going to have a party in here. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, come on. I said, are we going to have a party in here? Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're, uh, I want to see somebody's hands like this. Come on. Okay, then slow like this. How about this one? There it is. There it is. There you got it. mighty, he is powerful, he is strong. We want to celebrate him. We're so excited that you're here tonight. Oh, don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. Your hands are together, they look good tonight. Lift up that voice. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm.
Sometimes doing the right thing will make you look really, really good. Sometimes it's going to make you look crazy. We don't get to decide how things turn out. But we get to decide what kind of person that we want to be and they want others to see. And being a person of integrity is going to lead to a life with a lot less regrets, a lot more respect, and a better idea of what to do in every single situation that you're in. So, I have some announcements. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Great. Enjoying summer? Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is our last night for our series, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And so next week, does anybody know what next week is? Messy game night. Are y'all ready? It's going to be epic. I don't think y'all are ready. We're going to remind you, but bring a towel and bring some clothes to change into because we're going to hose you down when we're done but it's going to be awesome so that'll be six to eight so make sure you're ready a towel and a change of clothes all right unfortunately most of you know that camp 220 has been canceled boo, boo. all right but miss rachel Seymour, where are you at Miss Rachel is heading up our Bethel 220 lock-in. She is planning everything, delegating everything, and it's going to be awesome. I know it doesn't take the place of camp, but it's something for you guys to look forward to. We're going to lock you in. We are going to have an awesome time. We're going to have food and games and worship and service and small groups. It's going to be awesome. So make sure that you attend. It's $25 that is due next Wednesday. So see me if you have any questions about that. All right. The next Wednesday after that is going to be our theme night. So I need some feedback what you guys want to do. Last year we did like a hippie night. So if you have any ideas, let me know. We're going to go all out on this. Our next one is bonfire. So we're going to do a big bonfire. We're going to worship, and we'll have marshmallows and s'mores and things like that, so you don't want to miss it. So July is full of fun events where we can just reconnect, take a break from small groups, and just have fun together. All right. On Sunday mornings, if you're here and if you don't come, we would love to have you first service at 9 o'clock a.m. Ms. Valerie Lalonde, where are you at? right here. She leads our Bible study upstairs. Um, They're talking about spiritual beings. It's very interesting. So if you are are not here and you want to attend, make sure you're here at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings. And then we have a picture. Our students served last Thursday at our special needs music event. And we have a picture. Look at all those students serving. We have a youth group with a lot of students who have a servant's heart. And I'm so, so proud of you guys. Are you guys ready to worship? Are y'all ready to worship? Let's do it. Let's all stand up. So here's the goal tonight. We recognize that we come in here. It's been a crazy day. We jump around. I had everybody jumping up and down. But there's also a moment that we need. And what that moment is, is just you and just the Savior. So tonight, our goal is for the Lord to meet us in this place, and I know that he will. He's faithful to do that. So my encouragement to you is treat tonight like it's him. Treat tonight like it's just you and him. If you don't know the words, that's okay. They're going to be right up here. But we want to encourage you, open your mouth, sing. If you need to spread out, if you need to have a moment with the Lord in prayer, do that. If you need to come to the altar in the middle of the song, do that. That's okay. This place is for you. We have come here tonight for you to spend time with the Lord. So let's sing. Let's lift up our heart. Let's lift up our mind to him. Let's experience him in a powerful way this evening.
everything you do is good. Father, we know that's true, God. We know that everything you do, Father, is good. Father, we know that everything you do is for our good. Father, we just ask, Lord, that we would be one with you, God, that we would understand, God, that you have our best motives in mind, Father. You have everything in your head, Father, for our good. Father, and your promises are yes and amen to us. Father, we thank you for what you do. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this crazy season. Father, we just ask that you continue to move, Father, in our hearts and our lives. Amen. This next song is about offering our whole self to him, not just our mind, but our heart, all that we are. simple. Let's sing it together. You can have it all. Every part of my world. I take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. Sing, oh, the joy I found.
sing it. You can have it all, Lord, yeah. Every part of my world. Take this life, yeah. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. Sing it with us. Every part of my world I take this life and breathe this heart that is mine. Sing it one more time. Father, our prayer tonight is that you would intercept our life, that you would take this heart that is strayed from you, this heart that has done things that are clearly displeasing, this heart that has done things that we don't want to do, but yet we still do because of this flesh. Father, we ask tonight that as Megan comes, that you would speak into our life, that your Holy Spirit would come in, that you would save us, that you would change us forever that we would be completely yours. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, when you don't know how to do something, how to fix something, or how something works, what do you do? Ask a teacher? Ask your parents? Ask your friends? Ask someone you really know and trust? No, you go to the internet and ask some randos. But I'm not talking about creeps here. I hope. No, I mean the people of the internet. You know, those people who make how-to videos. Because chances are, if you're trying to figure out something, someone on the internet has already figured it out for you. Things like, how do I unsend a text? No. How do I do a winged eyeliner? How do I get rid of the zit by Friday night? How do I get out of gym class? How do I screen cap Snapchat without getting caught? But then there are things in life that don't have an easy fix, that don't have a simple solution, that don't have a how-to video. Things like what to do when you have problems with family, or when it seems like you have no control in your life, or what to do when someone has done something to you. I mean, clearly, they gotta go. The truth is, there's a lot of life that doesn't have a solution you can just find online. So how do you know what to do when you don't know what to do? So that's the question this month. So tonight we're going to talk about when you don't know what to do, pursue peace instead of payback. I decided to come down here instead of be up there. I felt disconnected from you guys, so I wanted to be closer. So I hope that's okay. Um, so when I think of payback, I'm thinking of last Wednesday, and I'll use Alyssa Seymour as an example. They all wanted to go to Waffle House, and she ran up to her mom. She's like, I only have $20. I need 20 more. Did you pay your mom back? No, me and the kids did. <laughs> so, you know, you say, oh, I'll pay you back. I promise I'll pay you back. Or you get up to the checkout counter and you've ordered your food and you go to reach for your pocket and you're like, oh, no, I left my debit card at home. And your friend's like, oh, I got, I got that. I'll pay you back. Okay? So that's what I think about when I hear payback. And so... Outside of paying money back to someone that you owe, the idea of payback can also come when someone hurts us. You know what I'm talking about, that kind of payback? Okay. For example, when someone talks about us behind our back, man, we want payback. Or when someone flirts with our girlfriend or boyfriend, we want payback. Or when someone fails to text us back or invite us to a group outing, we want payback for that. And in those moments when we've been hurt, we want to get back at them. We want payback. 
So maybe you don't all go scary movie on anybody or go crazy or terrifying revenge um, or write a song like so many song artists do these days. But we all try to get payback one way or another. We want them to feel the pain and we want them to feel the hurt that we felt when they did that thing to us. We want them to be embarrassed the way we were embarrassed. Our first reaction is almost always to get even. I know I struggle with that. Or at least they need to get something in return, even if it's just knowing that our shady Snapchat comment was really actually about them. So it isn't true, or isn't it true that the closer that we are to a person, that the more we want payback when they hurt us. So most of you aren't trying to get payback from someone else's brother or sister if you're not really close to them. Or your feelings probably aren't hurt when, you know, someone else's best friend texts their boyfriend. Or you probably aren't angry because of what someone else's ex did to them. The people who are closest to you and the people who you know the best have the most potential to hurt you. So they're most likely to be on your list of people who owe you payback, okay? So for most of us, payback comes in one of three ways. Public payback. If they embarrassed you in front of a group of people, you want to embarrass them back in front of a group of people. Then there's the passive payback. It's more subtle. Uh, We make comments that obviously aren't really hurtful, but could be interpreted in that way. Uh, We put those subtle posts on social media, hoping that people will pick up on what we're saying. Or we roll our eyes when someone's talking because we can't stand them. Or we ignore their texts. And then there's the imaginary payback. You ever play this out in your mind and you're like, I'm going to say this to them and this and this and this and this. And you just play it out all in your head. And you come out on top, but it never really happens. (laughs) All right, I do that sometimes. So we never actually really do anything. So that's passive passive payback. All right, and so and then there's perhaps the most satisfying payback of all, and that is enjoying to watch those people fail. Could be at sports, could be fail their test, okay? Um, Our ex broke up with us for someone else, and so when they end up breaking up with your ex, it's like, ha. Or our mom snaps at us and hurts our feelings and now she's crying and she's apologizing to us. And it's the perfect setup for us to put an exclamation point on her regret. Or it's that guy who made fun of us in third grade and we still really, really, really hate him for it. And then he face plants during the pep rally game. Ha, great. And that's exactly the sort of situation that Joseph is going to find himself in as we wrap up Joseph's story. So we have been focusing on Joseph's story this entire series. We've gone through the life of Joseph, and his, his story is a crazy one, uh, where oftentimes he has no idea what he's going to do next. Early in the series, we talked about how Joseph knew that he was his dad's favorite out of 12 brothers, and he rubbed it in his brother's faces. And then God began to give him dreams And he tells his brothers all about it. One day you will all worship me. And he's the youngest of 12 brothers, and so they hate him. They think he's super annoying, and so so annoying that they plot to kill him. And, of course, they have mercy like we've talked about, and they sold him into slavery. And so we've covered how Joseph was a slave in Egypt, and we talked about last Wednesday how he was thrown into jail for honoring God. And so tonight, we're going to look at um, how Joseph is eventually placed in charge of all of Egypt. So God has his hand on Joseph all throughout this journey. He becomes second in command of Pharaoh. Remember, Pharaoh's like top dog, okay? He is second in command at this point in the story. It's not a bad outcome for a kid who was sold into slavery. And of course, with Joseph's story, there's a plot twist. After Joseph was second in command, there's a food shortage where his family lived, okay, where his brothers and his father lived. So Joseph's dad, Jacob, sends his brothers to Egypt to ask for food because their country was out and they are starving. They don't have any food. 
So at this point in the story, Joseph's family thought he was dead. So they all thought he, he was sold into slavery. They told his dad that he died. And so his brothers thinks, oh yeah, by now he's gone. All right. So when they arrive in Egypt and they see Joseph, not really knowing it's Joseph yet, a huge drama unfolds. So you can read some of the interactions in your own time in Genesis 42 through 50. You don't want to miss it. If you have some quiet time at home, you really want to go back and read all of Joseph's story. Reading through back and forth and knowing the backstory to all of this is like being in a movie. So let's pick up in Genesis 45. So it says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there is no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. So Joseph noticed his brothers, but his brothers did not notice him. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. So imagine the tension and the emotion in this moment. Joseph is face to face with the people who tried to kill him, his own brothers who sold him into slavery, the same brothers who are here, ironically, asking him for help. This was a great get what's coming to you moment. Everything has been set up perfectly. Payback was just dropped into Joseph's lap. And so Joseph could have refused them food. He knew they were starving. He could have had them thrown into prison and maybe given them a taste of their own medicine and had them killed. They were certainly willing to do that to him. So let's pause for a second. I want you to think in your mind, what would you have done? So these people that have hurt you, they've hindered your life, thrown you into slavery. These people that you were the closest to, they're your brothers. They tried to kill you and then they threw you into slavery. Honestly, I don't really know what I would have done in that moment. So as the story continues, Joseph, he asked his brothers to walk over and to stand close to him. You can imagine the terror in his brothers' faces at this moment. And this is what Joseph says to them. I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So there's only one reason Joseph could have responded the way that he did. He didn't try to get payback in this moment because he had already let go of the idea of revenge. He had already done the hard work of forgiveness. How do we know that? Because Joseph could have looked in the eyes of the ones who had caused him the most grief in his life and care about how they were feeling. When Joseph said, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, he was acknowledging their wrong and he was acknowledging his hurt without creating any more hurt in the situation. Only a healed person could make this decision. Only someone who had forgiven could do this. Joseph chose forgiveness over payback. And we see that in the moment when he had the greatest opportunity for revenge, he chooses forgiveness. Somewhere between being sold into slavery and being reunited with his brothers, Joseph did the hard work of giving his hurt to God and allowing God to be his central in his healing. That's why Joseph was so quick to acknowledge God in the area where his brothers had caused him the most pain. It didn't make what his brothers did okay. 
It didn't make Joseph's pain any less. It just took the real pain and the real hurt and no longer put them center stage. He put God center stage and he made that, God made that forgiveness possible for Joseph. Forgiveness was not only for his brothers. It was freedom from his own pain as well. Joseph went on to tell his brothers to go to get their father and to move the entire family into Egypt because the famine would continue and without making this big move, his family would suffer and then this happened. It says in Genesis 45, 15, and he kissed all of his brothers and he wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. So that may be the only thing better than payback is reconciliation. This is where we see God do the impossible in a relationship. He brought peace where there had only been hurt for so long, all because Joseph chose forgiveness. So when it comes to other people that are hurting us, we too have the opportunity to choose something better than just payback. In fact, a simple way to remember it is when you don't know what to do in a situation, you need to pursue peace instead of payback. When you pursue peace, you are fighting for that relationship. You can fight to win, you can fight to be right, you can fight to make a point, or you can fight for the urge for payback and pursue peace, but you can't do both. You can't have peace and you can't have payback. Joseph preserved his relationships with all of his brothers because he chose peace over payback. He was only able to do this because he fought for forgiveness. He didn't do that on his own. He needed God to come in and be his center, and he needed God to come in and put forgiveness there. He was only able to forgive with the help of God. Joseph didn't have superpowers that allowed him to do this. I don't have that superpower, and you don't have that superpower. He just had the determination to do the work that peace required and the understanding of God at work in this situation, which means that you and I have the same power living in us. And when you pursue peace, you lay down your rights to get payback. You let go of revenge. You say goodbye to your desires to get even with that person. Instead, you choose the path of forgiveness you choose God's story of reconciliation instead of your own story of payback and revenge. This is a lot easier said than done and something that you're gonna have to work on daily. It's something that I have to work on daily, but the ultimate benefit is for us. That's why God wants this for us. You not only have peace with that person, you have peace with yourself. So because what happened to you isn't what happened to Joseph. In fact, I could tell dozens of stories and none of them would be exactly like yours. I have my own stories and you have your own stories. Maybe you spent this whole time wondering, do you always have to reconcile? Do you always have to pursue peace? What about when the relationship is really toxic? What if you're the one who did the hurting and you're the one who needs the forgiveness? Each of us have a unique and complicated situation and figuring out what it looks like to pursue peace is not always easy and it's not always clear. That's why your small groups are so important. That's why it's so important that you come and that's why it's so important that you break up into small groups so you can share about what's going on in your life, in your real life, with your real friends and your real families. So as we, call, as we uh, have the worship team up, I want you to think about what you have the power to do when it comes to pursuing peace and maybe a situation that you're in right now or maybe that you've been in for a long time. What do you need to decide tonight? Who do you need to forgive? Maybe it's somebody in this room. Maybe it's not. What offense do you need to bring to God? and ask God to be your center and ask God to bring forgiveness into that situation. Guys, he can do incredible things with the stories that you have. And you might not even be able to imagine what he can do right now. So I want to just give you a time to respond. I'm gonna have our small group leaders up. If 
if you need prayer, if you need to grab someone and just tell them about what's going on with a relationship, a family member, a friend, um, we're here for you guys. We want to listen. We want to pray. We want to speak life into that situation. And we want to be here for you. So I just want to give you a time to respond. If God's tugging at your heart, grab a leader.